make it a little noisy. But you can turn those off, okay? Praise the Lord. It is good to see you this morning. Some of you are shaking the wet off. Glad it's raining, so I'm not going to complain about that. Amen. Amen. It's good to see my family here, at least some of them. Praise the Lord. I know Tim's probably already introduced y'all, but is everybody okay? You all right, Phil? P squared, you okay? That's you. (laughs) Well, amen. Uh, It's not too late to beat your children, is what I want to tell Phil today. (laughs) We're dealing with a message, series of messages on parenting. We've talked a lot about uh, styles and some of those things about that, but the issue is having no regrets, parenting. And uh, I wish I could tell you that that could absolutely be guaranteed in, in life, but it never really is. But we can believe God all the way through. Amen? And we can see God do great things. It's a difficult job today, especially being a parent in the world that we're living in. And uh, I, I, maybe you're like me. About the time my kids left home, I felt like I was just beginning to discover how to do it. You know? And so uh, maybe we need to have another batch. Or is that why God gives us grandkids, maybe? So certainly don't want another batch, do we? Do we, Kathy? No, Kathy says, we're all right with grandkids. Okay, well, but the most important thing is that whatever you're doing as a parent, obviously you need to be on the same page and doing what God would have you do in this regard. Last week I shared this verse to start out. Well, not that verse. That's the topic of training versus raising kids today, and we'll get into that in a little bit. But the idea is not to raise children. We've talked about raising peas and carrots and training soldiers. The idea is that we do train. The Bible says train up a child in the way he should go. But understand, about your children, it's important you realize that they are a gift from the Lord. And as I said last week, it's not a gag gift, all right? They're, just, they're a gift from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward, not a curse. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. God wants your kids to be a blessing in understanding that where they come from, who they are, and what the goal is in their life. Last week, we dealt with the bottom line of that message being this. It's our job as parents to raise spiritual children. And a lot of times we miss the mark because we gauge our progress and measure our progress by wrong standards. And the standards is not, well, are they in a gang? Are they doing drugs? Are they smoking dope? Are they having you know, immoral sexual conduct in their life? All those things, you think if I, if I can get them, they don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, then I've succeeded. Well, you may have succeeded from a worldly perspective, but uh, that's not the goal ultimately. The goal is to raise spiritual children. People who, when they get to the point in their life, they start being adult, and they, they will get to that point sooner or later, I trust. And they start acting like adults, that they'll have a heart for God, and they'll understand that God has a purpose and a plan for their life. And uh, sometimes when people start talking about these issues, it's like they don't uh, really get a grip on it until they're at the point where all the kids have been raised. It's like the man who said, you know, I, when I first started in the ministry, I had five theories, good solid theories, on how to raise godly children. He said, but I had no kids. He said, some years later, uh, I had five kids and no theories. So <laughs> maybe that's the way you feel today in regard to raising children. But they are, when last week, we, these were the topics, the, the mandate of dedication we talked about and the manner our, of our demeanor, what was our parenting styles and what the mandate was is to raise children in the nurture of the admonition of the Lord and, and then how do we do that? And we talked about different parenting styles that are out there and then brought up ultimately the biblical model for the parent and finding out what God designed for parents, then we can start dealing with this issue of, our, of raising the children, training our children, and I call it discipline of our children, and that doesn't just deal with uh, the aspect of some negative portion where you have to spank a child, but discipline, it really boils down to this, discipling our children. What, what's our method for doing this? Where do we go, where, where do we seek, where do we find the answers? And I believe, obviously, we find the answers from the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, that he's given us a standard and a model, and it's a biblical model, and it's, it's a successful model. Proverbs 23 says, we do not hold correction from a child. If thou beatest him with a rod, you sh- he shall not die. Now, I know people have taken this extremely uh, out of order into what God's biblical principles are for raising our children. But the idea here is that even that physical discipline is not going to kill your child, especially if it's done from a biblical perspective in ways that God would raise and discipline our children. Uh, the Living Bible, you know I'm not a big fan, but this is a pretty good uh, 
uh, breakdown of the verse itself in, in regard to how we, we raise our children. You know, don't fail to correct your children. The discipline won't hurt them. They won't die if you use a stick on them. Punishment will keep them out of hell. Amen. And there's more truth to that than what most of us realize. The discipline, if it's done properly, will steer them in the right direction. And the right direction is obviously not the direction of the world. It's the way of the Word and what God wants for their life. So the idea gets down to this, uh, how can I be a parent? I mean, in the day and age we live in, uh, can I be a good parent? Can I be this biblical parent? And the simple secret is this, folks, you really can be a godly parent. It's possible, even in the culture that we're living in, to be a godly parent. You say, where do you go for help at that point? I think the obvious answer uh, is the Lord. And Matthew 5 tells us we have a Heavenly Father. Be perfect, even as your Heavenly Father is perfect. Now, understand God is perfect. That's a growing process. It's a maturing process. But the good thing about this maturing process is that we have the model before us, and it's our Heavenly Father. We can discover, if we take the time, if we take the self-discipline, if we use self-control, discover just what kind of father our God is, and then seek to be a father like Him. As we said last week, the goal of all that is ultimately that we are like Him and that our children are like Him. This is God's purpose for our life. He's conforming us to the image of His dear Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So God is working in me as a parent. God is working in my children. It's all the same goal that He's working in, is to be more like Jesus in our life and allow the Spirit of God to transform me, to follow the disciplines in my life that He's giving me, and then to have that discipline to be the kind of parent in discipling my children that He wants, wants me to be. But we have, a good, we have a good model out before us, and that's our Heavenly Father. And you don't have to guess at that if you take time to study, to read, to pray over the Word of God, you get a very clear picture of the kind of parent that your Heavenly Father is and the kind of parent that you need to be. I, I'm not going to approach this as know-it-all because I certainly don't know it all, and I certainly haven't succeeded as a parent in every step of the process. But I would fail us greatly if we did not lay out clearly what the Bible does teach us and seek to Seek to move within that order and seek to find out what that plan is and to follow God's plan for being the kind of parent and disciplining our ch children and discipling our children the way He would have us do it. So let me just lay out several things for, for you today, I think, that, will, that, are, that are biblical principles that will help you as a parent and also help your children to be what God wants them to be. First of all, I must understand my children. Psalms 103 says, As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear Him for he knows how we are formed. Probably the number one complaint from your teenager, if you have teens in your house, is something like this. You don't understand me. You may have heard that before. <laughs> you don't understand me. Well, problem is not that they don't understand you, young person. A lot of times you don't even understand yourself. And usually it's in those teenage years that you really get confused about who you are. And that's when even more you need a parent who wants to move and work and minister in your life to direct you towards Jesus and the cross so that you can be transformed like we talked about into the image of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. But I do believe at the same time, parents need to make an effort. It requires patience. It requires personal discipline to really understand your children. Not all your children are the same. Some of you are blessed to have more than one, and you have two or three or four or more, and every one of those children are different. Every one of them. My mom has six kids. Every one of them are weird. I mean, different. <laughs> They're just all different. I mean, they each have different gifts, different personalities, different sets of skills in their life, different ways that, that the Lord has made them, uh, different motivations. Uh, there's just differences in each, in each child. Proverbs 24, 3 says this, Homes are built on the foundation of wisdom and understanding. So I have to go to God over each of my children and ask God how to have wisdom, how to, how to, to minister in that life so that it's effective in that life. I mean, there, there are ways that my mom even is being, coming up and raising us, you know, and she had some bizarre ways of, of chastening us. Can I get an amen from the front row at least? <laughs> one, and you know, one was sitting in the bathroom. You go to the bathroom. I don't need to go to the bathroom. You go to the bathroom anyway. Now, for Camille, that was probably entertaining. She'd get in the bathroom, she'd study the butterflies on the wallpaper or something, you know. It's just artworks that she had a bent for that. For me, it drove me crazy. You know, I couldn't sit still. 
You know, I just, I, I was like a ball bouncing off the wall all the time. And the bathroom punishment was kind of like being sent to hell. <laughs> it was terrible. I, did, I would crawl out the bathroom window and try to get back before time and didn't always succeed at that. So it was more bathroom. It was a terrible time in my life. Each child's different. Do you know what it is that, that God's doing? God's purpose and plans for each child are different. And that's where this wisdom and this understanding come. We have to seek God's face in regard to that. Proverbs 22, 6 says, You train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he will not turn from it. I think there's kind of a parallel thing here that God's saying to us. The obvious one that most embrace here is that I'm going to raise my children in the nurture the admonition of the Lord, and as they get down the road, if they do rebel, God's going to work in their life to bring them back home like the prodigal, all right? There is an application, but I think the meaning here, especially when you look in the Hebrew of what this word train up a child in the way, having to do with a bent, having to do with a peculiarity of each child. What's, how, how are you going to raise that child? The basics are all the same, but there's a unique process, I believe, that parents can have with each child and what it is that's going to affect them the most or, you know, minister to them most or motivate them the most. And this is where wisdom comes in. But praise God, James tells us if we lack wisdom, God will give it liberally. He'll give it freely. But you, you, have, you have to wait for it and you have to seek God's face for it. There is a promise here, I believe, about return, but it's not just a promise, promise, it's really a proverb about finding how that child, what God has done in that child's unique disposition, his personality. But it goes much deeper than that, and a lot of people stop right there in it, if that's the point. You know, those are the two points. But let me tell you that way in which your child, that he's talking about, and the way he should go. The way he should go is towards the cross. The way he should go is on the narrow way. The way he should be going is towards truth. So ultimately, no matter how your child is fashioned by the sovereignty of God, you know the clear direction you're supposed to be steering that child in his life. It's towards Jesus. It's towards the cross. And you cannot, you cannot leave that out of raising children today. You've got to find out who they are, yes, but at the same time, you've got to keep focusing them on the Lord Jesus Christ and the work that he desires. He says we need patience. We need understanding. Proverbs 14, 26 says a man of understanding has patience, all right? So let's seek to be, let's seek God and let's get wisdom. Let's seek God and get understanding. And if we're going to wait for that, patiently wait for it, we'll have what we need. And I think one of the ways that really proves if we are seeking to really understand our children will be this concept of patience. And it's probably one of the hardest things for any of us to get our hand around. We want things, and we want things to happen now like they are in our culture and our society. But there has to be this point that you as a parent, especially you younger parents right now, you've got to seek to really understand your child and really seek to know what God's working and how he's working in their heart and their life. The second thing I think we need to get a grip on is acceptance. I must accept my children. Now, most people say, well, you know, I, I accept my children. But do we accept our children? You know, each child, as we said, is unique, and each child is, is, is uniquely fashioned by God. And we accept them. And sometimes parents don't really accept their children. You know, they're too busy trying to shape their children, not into the image of God, but into their own particular image. The key word here is grace. Psalms puts it this way. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, rich in love. That's the parent we have in our Heavenly Father. Can we, in turn, seek God's grace, seek God's wisdom, seek God's understanding, and begin to pray this for ourselves? Lord, that I would be gracious and compassionate with my children, slow to anger, and rich in love. There's another passage which we preach to church all the times in different formats in Romans where it says, accept one another, receive one another. And that means it not just to welcome someone and shake their hand, glad you're here today, but to realize that that person is uniquely made by God and they're different and we're all different and I'm willing to accept you. One of those great lines of acceptance, one of, the, one of the greatest poetic verses in Scripture is when God brings Eve before Adam and here's this great verse of acceptance. This is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. For this call, basically saying, I receive her, I accept her, I take her for everything she is and for everything she isn't. It's not a spouse's role, and we discussed this at our weekend retreat this last weekend, to fashion your spouse into your image. But it's to work with God so that they can be fashioned to the image 
of his dear son, Jesus Christ. And it's the same with our children. And so many times parents are just struggling to kind of duplicate within that child themselves. I mean, let me remind you of something. Children are a gift, like that scripture we read. And that gift came from God. And let me remind you this. You didn't choose them yourself. You didn't choose them. God gave that child. You put that child in your family. God did that. And at this point is where I say, God, all right, this ultimately, if children are a heritage of the Lord, this child belongs to you. And I want to cooperate with you in raising this child that you've given me, this, this rule and this, and, and this life over. Give me the direction, the understanding, the wisdom I need so that I can receive this child the way you are working within them. In other words, don't, don't necessarily seek to make them like yourself. I mean, you may have been real good in school, my mama was real smart. Didn't mean I would be. All right? Don't, don't try, you know, if they're, if they're not an athlete and you were an athlete, it's, it's okay, all right? You can get through life without being the star football player. It's possible. You don't have to press them into every team and every situation because you don't want them to miss out. You need to find out what God's doing and what kind of child that is. Even in regards to different personality issues. Uh, my son is funny, but he doesn't have my sense of humor. He has some other traits that I have. But he's got more of his mother's sense of humor, which is helpful because she kind of laughs at everything I say. <laughs> when I'm trying to be funny, let me put it that way. <laughs> the lack of recognition for, the, for our understanding, this child is from God and he belongs to God and that child is to be shaped by the grace of God, you know, that's an important principle. It, and if you can do that, you know, then God's going to do something special in your child. But if you're the kind of parent just trying to always shape your child into your image, you know, eventually, this child's going to end up kind of saying to himself, you know, my parent, my, my mom, my dad, you know, they're just not going to receive me nor accept me unless I'm just like they are. I think you understand. Now, there's dimension that, that there's some things that I want my children to be. I want them to be like me in regard to I love Jesus. And we're not talking about that. We're talking about these elements of their, their, their quirks and personalities and, and, and the things that motivate them in life. You accept your children. You accept one another. You receive them for everything they are and for everything they might not be in your particular eyes. The third thing is, and importantly, is I must discipline my children. The Bible says the Lord disciplines those that he loves, Hebrews 12, 6. Why does he discipline us? Well, Scripture makes it clear. It's a, it's a sign of God's love. That since God really does care about me, he cares about my life. He cares about my actions. He, he cares about my, my direction. He cares about the deeds I do in my life. He cares about everything about me. And if I'm moving in the wrong direction, if I'm making bad choices, God is a loving God. He's so concerned about me, he'll correct. We'll make some course adjustments in my life. Sometimes those course adjustments are severe. Sometimes God has to deal with me in areas that he's, he's directing me to, and I don't like it perhaps, but the Bible says if I'm without chastening, in Hebrews 12, then I am no longer a son, I am illegitimate. Now for you King James Version lovers, there's a little bit more severe term that it uses for that illegitimate phrase. But the idea is, if there's no discipline, I'm not really a child of God. In other words, if I can live any way I want to live, choose to sin, and God not spank me over it, deal with me over it, if I'm happy in it, then something's wrong. There's only pleasure in sin for a season for the child of God. Even for a lost person, they just never realize it. But for, especially for those that are children. Why? Because you are indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. The greatest gift that could ever be given to you as a person has been granted unto you at rebirth. If you're genuinely born again, the Holy Spirit of God himself is in you. Your body is the what? The temple of the Holy Spirit. That means that wherever I am, God is, because he's in me. And part of that ministry of God in me is to ultimately make me more like Christ. It's all working in context with the will of God to conform me to the image of his son, Jesus Christ. What if I'm not living like that? What if I'm not pursuing that? What if the Holy Spirit's in me, you can be sure, you can be absolutely sure you're a child of God because you can't get away with it. Nothing's going to work out for you. Nothing is working out for you. In fact, you're lonely, even though you may be surrounded by people. In fact, you're friendless, even though you've got a lot of people say you're friends. You just know there's real, no real connection. What was that silly country western song that came out talking about more along the uh, romantic love? was looking for love in all the wrong places. <laughs> That's exactly where Christians are who are not lying the work of the Holy Spirit in their life. 
the office ministry, the, the main task of the Holy Spirit is working you to make you like Jesus. If I'm not doing that, guess what he's doing? That ministry of, uh, of acceptance and wooing and drawing and shaping is not taking place. That, that place of peace and joy and victory and abundance, that ain't happening. What is happening? The ministry of wooing me, gently calling me. Now is frustration in my life. Now there's, you know, there's anger in my life. Now there's impatience in my life. Now it's just all kinds of junk going on, and I'm not a happy camper. And it's, you're never going to be a happy camper until you start camping in God's campground. Get right with God. Get your heart right with God. Now, what if you're not a Christian? No big deal. You can go do your own thing, and, you know, and if you're not happy, it's no big deal either, you know. And your life is miserable because God loves you enough. His sign, evident sign in your life that you really are a child of God is you can't get away with it. You can't get away with it. You'll never be happy. It's like sticking a, a square peg in a round hole. It, don't, it wasn't made for that. So whenever you res resort to turning from God as a child of God, it doesn't work out. And the same carries on in my parenting styles. My kid's not moving towards the cross. If my kid's not, you know, responding in the way that he should be responding and, 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 resp and responding to the dis discipling in his life, then I'm going, to, I'm going to minister to him in whatever regard is necessary. In fact, the Bible makes it clear that if I, do not sh if I don't do this, if I don't discipline my child, Proverbs 13, 24 says, if you refuse to discipline your son, it proves you don't love him. You could say the same thing as a Christian. If God's not disciplined, that just says God doesn't love me. God's going to let me run to wreckage, run to ruin. And we don't do that as parents because we love our children. And God doesn't do it because he's the righteous, perfect model of, heavenly, of a heavenly father. So we follow that same standard. We discipline our kids. Now, there is a difference between what we would call uh, secular punishment and biblical discipline. When the world talks about maybe spanking a child, it's awful, it's, it's, you know, it's taboo, you know, you're going to ruin the child, you know, you're going to warp his brain if you whoop his butt, uh, bottom, excuse me. Uh, you know, you, mama's here, I've got to be very careful. <laughs> so we, we want to be very careful so we just don't d destroy our children. But understand this, there's a difference between what the world perceives as, as spanking and punishment and what biblical discipline and a biblical spanking would be. Remember the Bible says if I don't discipline them, I participate in their destruction. So I don't want to do that. I don't want to see them destroy themselves. I want to discipline them while they're young enough to learn. If you don't, it just leads to destruction. So here, here's, here's the big difference between what we'd call secular punishment and biblical discipline. Secular punishment will focus on uh, to inflict penalty. Biblical discipline, that's not, the, that's not what it's all about. The purpose for disciplining my children is promote growth. They become spiritual people. They, they learn to hear from God. They learn to respond to God. In regard to secular punishment, the focus is upon your actions, what you just did, what happened, what, what was in the past, whereas in the context of being a Christian parent with my children, I am focused on something else. I'm focused on their path that is out in front of them. I want them making right choices. I want them leading a life that's abundant and full for their life. And, and so you talk about your purpose is different, your focus is different, even your attitude is different. With secular punishment, it, the, the attitude is an attitude of anger. You did this, and because you did that, if you hadn't done that, you, but you did that, so you're going to pay the price for it. I'm going to rip your arm up and beat you with it kind of thing. You know, just anger. We're on the other, the other side of this with biblical discipline, discipline, there's an attitude of love. What you did was wrong. Why, and here's why it's wrong. And if you continue to make choices like this, this is where this leads. So there's a difference in the whole focus, the whole attitude, and I believe the, the difference is in the results as well. With secular punishment, it's fear, it's guilt, it's more anger. But with biblical discipline, I believe it leads to security in the life of a child. You have well-established boundaries that they can stay within, and those boundaries produce protection. They provide security for a child. But if they're left with an unruly spirit and an unruly heart, not only is their life going to be filled with fear and guilt and more anger, they'll go into life that same kind of way. So there's, there is a clear difference when you begin to look at what the Bible teaches versus what the world teaches. You don't want, when you discipline your children, even though you may be spanking them, that, they're, uh, that, that, that they walk away with this attitude of that they're afraid of you. And a lot of that comes on right in the beginning. And that's why parents, 
before you discipline your children, you may need to take a chill pill for a moment. You may need to settle down. You don't need to be disciplining your children with this anger attitude because that's, that shows you have the wrong mind going on here, the wrong, the wrong frame of reference here. The goal is not to, to, to make them perfect. The goal is to mold them in the image of the Lord Jesus Christ, obviously that leads to one day perfection or glorified, but it's not this my perfection mold and what I want to see. A child does something wrong. So here's the response. You did that wrong. Your deeds were wrong, so you're going to pay the price for it. That's not what God does with us. And he's the model, remember. What does God do with us? All my deeds were wrong, but Jesus Christ paid the price for all my sin. On the cross, he paid the price. On the cross, everything I've ever done, everything I ever will do, has been paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ. All my sin. Hallelujah. All your sin is paid for. So then why is God chasing you? He doesn't chasing me for what I've done. He chastens me with something else completely in mind for where he's taking me, what he wants to accomplish in me, what he wants to fulfill in my life, fullness, completion, wholeness in my life. There's a, great, there's a, there's a vast difference between those things. The goal is different. The focus is different. The attitude is different. And the result is different. I don't live afraid of God. Not in the context of man fear, but it's a fear in a righteous way. The Bible says there's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out all fear. That's what God's doing in our life. It drives it out because fear has to do with punishment. So there's a difference between punishment and discipline. The goal of discipline is different. The purpose is different. The focus is different. The attitude is different, and the result is completely different. Biblical chastening will involve spanking, all right, but it's done the right way, and it's done with the right attitude. And by the way, those little behinds, they're all fat and full. They're made for hitting with, a, with, a, with, a, with an item of your choice, all right? A belt, a, 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 a paddle, a spoon, whatever it is that you have peace about using, all right? He said, that's not going to kill them, but I want you to know uh, it will remind them. And I think that that begins at early ages. And if you do it in the early ages, by the time they're teenagers, you shouldn't still be whipping your kids. Amen. In fact, if you do it right, I believe you'll have to whip them less. Come on. Amen? But we, we resist that because, you know, sometimes our, our, our kids are just, you know, they're, they're all rebellious. And I'm going to talk about different types of rebellion in just one moment. But we don't want to get into this thing of, of just performance living, you know. Uh, well, Daddy's here. I like just right. What, what we want to teach our kids is when daddy's not here, he'll act right. You know, it's not just the presence of, of, the, of being afraid of someone. So there is a proper way to discipline. Let me just carry this with three more points in this regard. One, we do it first and foremost calmly. The Bible says a fool gives full vent to his anger. Ephesians 4 says, don't keep scolding and nagging your children, making them angry and resentful. You use loving discipline. In other words, just, the more you just harp on your kid and don't exercise discipline, the worse it is. You're aggravating them. If you're just a nagger and you say, you do that one more time, you do that one more time, you do that one, you're just going you know, to do that. You get out of there, you get out of there, you get out of there right now. Get out of there. You're going to break the, right, one more time, what? And it's always one more time, but you never do anything. You just whine and gripe and nag. That, that's not discipline. All right? It doesn't work on you and it doesn't work on them. That's not the way God works in our life. So there has to be discipline, but it needs to be done, and it needs to be done calmly, not to relieve your anger or to take out your frustration. You don't say, next time you do that, I'm going to kill you. You know, It's calm. Chill out. Amen? And it's an important thing. The second thing is quickly. Don't delay. Don't be that kind of parent who just says, wait till your father gets home. Because, you know, the child doesn't learn anything except how to smooth you for the next eight hours. You know, and how to sell himself over to you so that you don't tell father. And somehow, some parents do this, and it always makes dad the bad guy. And you always wonder why they love mom and hate dad. You know, you bear the responsibility. No one person should always be the, the heavy person, you know, the, the bad guy. If you refuse to discipline your son, it proves you don't love him, we said. But it goes on to say, if you love him, you will be prompt to punish him. And I don't know about you, but kids are smart, all right? You think your kid's stupid, he's smart. In fact, a lot of these kids are outsmarting their parents. And I'm talking about little kids, you know? You know, you can just be mad as a hatter, ready to boil over, and, and, and they know it's happening, so then they'll turn on the cute button. Yeah? 
They get real cute all of a sudden. You just can't bear to do anything about it. First of all, settle down, and then don't be sold a bill of goods. Get back to the business. Take care of it. Do, be responsive. But also, importantly, it's consistently. If you have to be the same all the time. If you spank for a certain offense today and you let it go tomorrow, that's a bad message. It's not going to work. It, you know, don't be that person who says, I'm not going to tell you again. I'm not going to tell you again. Just don't tell them again and do what you, you know you're going to do. And I learned early on with my own kids that we could teach our kids how to be obedient the first time or we could teach them third-time obedience. First-time obedience or fifth-time obedience. What, how, what are you teaching your children? The goal is to, for them to be godly. I want my children to grow up in such a way that the first time God says something, they say, yes, Lord. Yes. Where do they learn that behavior? They learn it from their parents. All right? So if, if you're the kind of parent who always puts it off and just says, next time, next time, next time, you're not accomplishing anything. You want your children to learn first-time obedience. So if you say, if you do that again, such and such and such is going to take place, and then they do it again, it's time for such and such and such to take place. And, you know, I, I have parents say, well, you know, I, I, I'm going to tell them three times, that's it. Well, you just chain, trained your children for third-time obedience. Is that what it takes with you, with God? We hope not. We want children to learn obedience promptly and righteously and completely. Teach them first-time obedience. Do what you say you're going to do. And by the way, about rebellion, I did say it can happen with different ways with different kids, all right? There's such a thing called rebellion that operates, first of all, with active rebellion. Direct defiance, disobedience, talking back, refusal to accept correction, rejection of authority. I had a brother's, a brother's, this was their method of rebellion. I was the younger brother. I learned something from that. I tried a different route of rebellion. I went to passive rebellion. Passive rebellion has to do more with an arrogant look, an attitude, you know, pretending not to listen, pleading ignorance. Oh, I didn't know. You know. They're both rebellion. It, one might be arrogant over his attitude. The other might just be sulking or pouting or whining or whatever it might be. Rebellion is rebellion, and it has to be dealt with, and discipline has to take place. So don't be fooled, because one seems to be more of a, well, I just, one of my kids just really, but they probably both are, and they just manifest it in different ways. So the idea here is calmly, quickly, consistently. Fourth, I must express love my, to my children. And there's three ways that I just want to say very quickly in expressing love to our children. We need to in, in, in understand what they are. First of all, it's through affection. We will somehow lost this today of touching and hugging and holding and patting on the back. Psalms 145, 9 says, The Lord has compassion on all he has made. And I can guarantee you, when I slow, slow down long enough in my own quiet times and time with the Lord, there's that time I, I experienced God in my life of, of the compassion, you know, uh, of him, of just knowing that his presence, just having the peace that comes with that, just knowing he's, that he's there. there there's, a, there's a calm, there's a joy that's there. And it should be as a parent that around my kids, I, I'm not afraid to, to show and express my affection to them. I love you. We, we're huggers in our family, you know. We, we embraced each other. We, we, we kiss, we love, we care about each other. Fathers today somewhere have lost some of this. And as a father, you need to have the courage to love your children in, in a very demonstrable way by hugging them and holding them and letting them know. You know, if, if you're not that kind of person, just set yourself up a little project today to say, you know, I'm going to give some loving touch to every person in my family today and let them know that, that I love them and I care about them. That's through, uh, obviously, affection, then through affirmation. Uh, the Lord upholds and uplifts those who are down, Psalms 145 goes on to say in verse 14. In other words, you affirm your children, and a lot of that's done with your words. Now, I know this, and it's, 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 this is a kind of a, a careful issue you, you have to walk in a, in a tight line you have to walk, especially when your kids are real little, and they're three and four years old, because uh, kids are funny. Aren't kids funny? I mean, kids, and, and, and it can be real funny when, when you're trying to be real serious, and they're funny, and they're not even trying to be funny. But they'll just say some of the funniest, stupid stuff sometimes, and, and you laugh at them instead of laughing with them. And it, it, it's, it's a cautious thing. I, I have a little four-year-old granddaughter. I, you know, I've caught myself in this regard before because she can just look at me and she's trying to, you know, uh, project some real deep life meaning to me. And she says it and you want to go... <laughs> it might have been funny, but that wasn't a thing to do. 
And that's not the way that's going to, that's not the thing that's going to uh, affirm someone. You learn when to laugh. Otherwise, some kids might think that you're actually mocking them. Uh, the, the, learn your, and teach your kids at the same time, have enough humility that if you do laugh at the wrong point, to, to, to tell them that was a failure on your part, so they can learn it's okay even at that point. You want, you want, you want your kids to be able to tell you even when they blow it, that they blew it. And if you're going to be smirking or mocking or laughing, then there's not going to be such a compliance to that in their life. You, you affirm your children, not just when they do their best, not just when they hit the home run, not just when they, you know, they won the game or they came home with a really good report card. Just find every way possible you can through affirmation so that there's more affirmation than there is just perhaps a physical discipline of them. There has to be balance, but also through attention. Psalms 145, again, our Father is near when we call unto them. When's the last time you sat down and gave your child just full attention? Just your complete attention. You know, Cornell University, I mentioned this study before, did that study where they put some microphones on children and they found out that uh, many fathers in this particular study, the longest set of, of time span of giving attention directly to the children speaking to them was about the average, of, well, it was less than 40 seconds, 37.7 seconds or something like that. May that not be said of Christian parents. It, it, there comes a time when you have to turn off the You know, and kids have so many devices and so many things and so many games and so many electronics. I mean, that's all well and fine, but there comes a time you say, hey, let's put that down and turn that off. I want to spend some time with you. Amen. You know, don't let them at the dinner table come out of that junk and start doing all that while you're trying to eat dinner. You know, just there, there comes a time, you know, where you, you, you give the greatest value of all in your life, and that is you, and that is your time. Uh, it's, it's, it's a ridiculous statement that people have made, you know, well, you know, it's, it's important that we give quality time, not quantity time. Listen, quality time is quantity time. How much time is needed? Well, I mentioned this last week, really a lifetime is needed. There's extremes to that. And then, then there are other extremes, and some parents spend way too much time with their kids, all right? And some, so much so that the child becomes so insecure they can't operate in their own life. So there's this balance of affection, affirmation, and attention. But most of all, as I close this today, I'll say this. I must be consistent with my children. The Bible says the Lord is righteous in all his ways. I'll steal a line from a Phil Arm sermon. You can't fight like two cats with their tails tied together and thrown over a clothesline in front of your children all the time and then expect them to respect you and your Christianity. This is not going to happen. There has to be consistency. There has to be patience in your relationship. You as parents have to be on the same page. You have to agree on these issues. You, 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 here's what happens. If you're not, I said your kids are smart. They know how to play mom against dad, and if she's not working it, then they'll go to dad against mom. And that's why there has to be a, a, a parental agreement that this is the way we're going to do this, and this, the, we, are going to be, we are going to be consistent. And by the way, you need to understand as parents that they see everything you do. You may close the door, but they hear. You know, your house is bugged. <laughs> you got little eyes and little ears. You're always watching. They're always listening. They know if you're being hypocritical about something, you know, uh, they see it. The Bible says this. It's a wonderful heritage to have an honest father in Proverbs 20. It says this. What does that mean? Somebody that's genuine. Have a, some, have a genuine father, somebody that truly loves God. That means a perfect father. That means a perfect mother. But it means they're genuine. Yes, there's going to be failures. And, you know, there are times when we probably need to sit down with our children and say, this is where I failed. This is where I blew it. And it was the dumbest thing I ever did. But I got right with God, and I made this choice to, to follow the Lord in my life. You know, we don't imply perfection. If we really want to show honesty in our life, don't, don't imply that you're the perfect parent. You have to come to the place where when you're wrong, you admit you're wrong. And part of that is also, especially for you with younger kids, of keeping your promises. The Bible says he's Lord, the Lord is faithful in all his promises. In fact, if you talk to children today, you'll find out the number one cause of bitterness in most children's lives today and in families is broken promises. Dad, you said we'd do this. Mom, you said we'd do this. Well, we can't do it. I changed my mind. Something came up. We're always changing what we said we'd do. And by the way, when you say maybe even little minds can't distinguish the difference between maybe and yes. We begin to show our kids that we, we're maybe not trustworthy, and even though we think we are trustworthy, and if they don't see any trustworthy in us as their parent, maybe they don't think God is trustworthy. You know, 
We need to teach them through our actions and through our life. The last verse in the Old Testament is this, and when I, I pray for our children and our families is this, you know, the heart, God will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. You want to experience personal revival in your life? That's when it happens. When the children of your life have their hearts in the hands of God, and God is able to turn those hearts and shape those hearts and move those hearts in the direction that he wants to move. So I'll end this with this. Submission is caught as well as taught. If a father and a mother are not submitting to Christ, how in the world can we ever expect them to submit to God? If I'm not going to submit to God in my life, what authority am I operating under? Tell my children. You cannot use the old slogan that says, don't do as I do, do as I say. That bears no weight. It may work for at first, but it's not going to work for long. You have to have a walk that honors God. And if your walk doesn't honor God, don't expect your children's to. I put it this way. You can't say, children, don't watch this show, but I'm going to DVR and watch it when you go to bed. You can't say, I'm going to this movie, but you can't. It just doesn't work that way. You have to have a standard that you raise up and you're, you're committed to, and it's a standard of righteousness, and it's a standard of holiness, it's a standard of godliness. You said, that's where I'm going to live, that's how I'm going to be, and that shows your kids that you're serious about your walk and your relationship to God. And if they do come to the place in their life where they begin to stray, boy, the power you have in prayer is phenomenal. I, will, I have honestly confessed before, I'll do so now in front of this congregation. I gave my mother hell by the way I lived in rejection to God. She was not pleased, her heart was broken when she'd see me knowing I wasn't right with God. That breaks the heart of a parent. But because she was true and faithful and righteous and right with God, continue to walk to a discipline and steadfastness in her own life, we know that God hears the prayers of the righteous. Praise God for that. Praise God for someone who prays for us. God's faithful. And I'm going to preach a whole sermon on what to do when we raise our kids in a certain way and they move in another direction in their life. And that'll probably be next Sunday. Because the Bible has a lot of stories like that and a lot of illustrations. Some lot, there's some godly kings in here who lived for God and submitted everything to God and had children who were just hellions. Watch what God did as a result, though, how God moved and how God restored and how God did. We'll look at some of those things. But let's stand right now with our heads bowed.